Good morning, teammates. I'm Lieutenant General Beegs Beagle, the Commanding General of the U.S. Army Combined Arms Center. On behalf of General James McConville, the Chief of Staff of the Army, and General Gary Brito, the Commanding General of U.S. Army Training and Doctrine Command, I'd like to take this opportunity to introduce the 2022 version of FM30, Operations. This new doctrine represents an inflection point for the Army. It marks our official transition to a new operating concept for Army forces, multi-domain operations, or better known as MDO. You may be asking yourself, what is MDO and how does it apply to you and those that you lead? FM30 reflects an evolution of Army doctrine that retains the timeless principles of war, but is updated to meet the challenges of the current strategic environment. Our mission stays the same, to be ready, to deter adversaries, and when called upon, win the nation's wars. FM30 describes how Army forces fight. It is also a catalyst for change across the Army and reinforces the Army's culture of training and education as critical for success. FM30 will drive updates to our organizations and military education, shape the fielding of new technologies, and inform the design of new weapon systems and other capabilities critical to our Army. As you read and learn about multi-domain operations, you're going to notice that it still demands a high degree of warfighting competency from all branches and occupational specialties, and expands upon the idea that combined arms approaches require real subject matter expertise to be effective. The mastery required for success only comes through a continuous commitment to learning through education, training, and experience. Like a professional athlete, musician, or doctor, you have to do your homework. You have to put in the hours during professional military education or PME, self-study, and tough realistic training. In short, our success depends on preparation. To assist you in your preparation, my team here at CAC has assembled a mobile training team that will be coming around to centers of excellence, installations, and major organizations. Let's face it, you're busy or you have a lot to do. Not everyone will be able to attend one of our MTTs, FM30 training sessions. So we've put together a video that will walk you through the major changes to Army doctrine. The brief that follows will help you launch your preparation. It will introduce you to multi-domain operations and explain some of the significant changes introduced into the new FM30. Colonel retired Rich Creed, the director of the Combined Arms Doctrine Directorate, or CAD, here at Fort Leavenworth spearheaded the development of our doctrine for multi-domain operations and delivers this brief. Rich is an experienced warfighter, having served on active duty for over 30 years as an armor officer and commanded at all levels from company to brigade. As good as the brief will be, it cannot address every question. So we've developed a number of training support products listed at the end of the brief to further explain some of the doctrine warfighting concepts introduced in the new publication. If you still have questions, don't hesitate to reach out to CAD for assistance. Lastly, as you learn more about multi-domain operations and become masters of your craft, remember that your nation expects you to be the best. Over to you, Rich. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Rich Creed. I'm the uh, director of the Combined Arms Doctrine Director here at Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. Uh, we're going to talk this morning about the new FM30, which is our capstone operations publication, right? That means it addresses uh, the high tactical uh, operational level of war, uh, and it's designed to inform how the U.S. Army uh, and Army forces fight on behalf uh, of Joint Force Commanders. And so what that means is that all of our doctrine is going to be influenced in one way, shape, or form by the things that are contained in FM30. So this briefing by itself is not enough to make you an expert on what's in the book. We need everybody, uh, particularly folks in the leadership position, uh, to be familiar with what's contained in FM30 because it should drive uh, how we train, organize, and equip our Army uh, for 2030, okay? Uh, and so we're gonna talk through a bunch of different ideas. Again, some of them we'll get into more detail than others. Uh, but the intent here is to give you a, a general sense of, of what's in FM30 and why it's important to you. Here's our agenda. We're going to talk a little bit about the evolution of our operational concepts over the last 40 years. Uh, and then you can see basically we're going to follow uh, the chapters of the book. We're not going to hit every single chapter or appendix, uh, appendix um, but we are going to talk uh, about some of the information that's contained in those books or in those chapters that uh, are not listed on the agenda. 
All right, so let's talk about how our doctrine evolves over time. Now, those of you in the audience that, that have significant gray hair that, that join our army in the 80s or 90s uh, have operated according to all four of the operational concepts you see up there on the chart. And so they were all multi-domain concepts in one way, shape, or form. If you look at the name Air Land Battle by its very title, it talks about air uh, ground integration, right? And it introduced this idea of a multi-domain extended battlefield where we need to affect enemy forces beyond that immediate close fight if we we're going to have a good chance of winning. And over time, those concepts have evolved. You can see the timelines up there. And each of the years up on the chart is another version of either 100-5 or FM30 that the Army published. Why did we change those over time? Well, we changed them uh, because the world around us changed and the things that the Army was asked to focus on over time changed. So if it was large-scale ground combat against the Warsaw Pact and North Korea uh, up through the early 90s, over time there were other things that our Army was expected to do in places like Somalia, uh, Haiti, uh, the Balkans, and so forth. And so we, we moved this idea of full spectrum operations where the Army does windows, right? We don't just get to focus on one thing. Uh, we have to do all of the things that a nation requires us to do. Over time, we learned lessons. And in Iraq and Afghanistan, we realized uh, that we needed to make a few changes. And that's where unified land operations came from. All right, but even then, uh, starting in 2017, that operational environment changed. We're going to talk about that in a minute. But what that did is drive us towards a focus beginning in 2017, not just on some of the ideas in that multi-domain battle, now multi-domain operations concept, uh, but also a focus on large-scale combat operations against peer threats, like a Russia or a China that can contest the US joint force in all domains. All right, so now in 2022, dated 1 October, we released the new FM30 uh, that makes multi-domain operations our operational concept still with a focus on large-scale combat operations against peer threats like a Russia, a China, Iran, or North Korea. All right, so let's talk about the reasons why here, this strategic environment. The National Defense Strategy talked about the four plus one or the two plus three, uh, China, Russia, North Korea, Iran, and then those violent extremist organizations that we still conduct operations against even today. And so while the focus of this book uh, is large-scale combat operations. We recognize that the Army, from a doctrinal standpoint, has got to be able to conduct irregular warfare and so forth. We've got other books that address those types of operations, and we continue to update those books, but that's not our focus here today. It's to focus on 3.0 and that uh, preparation for and execution of large-scale combat operations against peer threats. You see the threat methods up there. Uh, they're very broad. Uh, but they are things that were distilled out by the TRADOC G2 uh, in terms of uh, the, the approaches an adversary or an enemy would be most likely to use against the U.S. joint force. And so they're pretty self-explanatory. When you think systems warfare, think uh, integrated fires complexes, integrated air defense systems enabled by a global uh, ISR capabilities. Uh, when you think preclusion, you think about them trying to keep us out of some place. Isolation, uh, you can think of in terms of either attacking our coalition partners to separate them from us, or you can think about it in terms of physical isolation of US friendly forces or allied and partner forces uh, positioned outside of the continental United States that they're trying to keep uh, the rest of the US joint force from conducting expeditionary operations to support. Uh, and then sanctuary, and we've seen sanctuary, those of us that, that were in Iraq or Afghanistan, uh, but even looking at the war in Ukraine, uh, this idea that you use international borders to protect, uh, in this case, the adversary's forces from uh, interdiction by U.S. forces. We saw that in places like Pakistan or Iran uh, during the wars in CENTCOM over the last 20 years. And then people often ask, okay, so what makes uh, and a North Korea or an Iran, somebody we would consider a peer threat. Well, we, we consider them a peer threat in, in the context of where they would be most likely to conduct operations, particularly at the beginning of a campaign. They, they enjoy pretty natural advantages in terms of interior lines, uh, cultural affinity with the nations in there near abroad, the willingness uh, to move slowly over time to achieve their objectives, 
uh, and the advantages they have in terms of time and space to move very quickly to achieve those objectives before we can conduct expeditionary uh, operations out of the continental United States. They have capabilities that could contest us on all domains, like cyber uh, capabilities, or the ability to access uh, civilian space capabilities, uh, you know, to a level that was uh, unheard of 15 or 20 years ago. There are things now that are available as publicly available information to our adversaries that would have been uh, top secret classified uh, to very high levels uh, just a short time ago. And we see that uh, occurring in Ukraine uh, right before us. Uh, and, and so I already talked about the violent extremist organizations, but again, they're not something that uh, we can ignore and they are something that or they're the adversary or enemy that we're most likely to conduct operations on a continuous basis. However, but those peer threats like a Russia or China represent accidental threats to the United States potentially, right? So they're the most dangerous uh, form of conflict that the army could be asked to engage in. And what does that mean? Well, it's about accepting risk. So we're not gonna accept risk in terms of preparation for large scale combat against peer threats because you have time to adapt to a lesser threat. Right, so if you can deal with a Russia or China, you ought to be able to deal with a North Korea, Iran, or violent extremist organizations. If we were to focus on the most common form of conflict, the regular warfare, we would not be in a position uh, to win at acceptable cost uh, against any of those other adversaries. All right, so multi-domain operations. You got the description there at the top of the chart. There's a couple of ideas there that are, are important. Some of them are not new, they're enduring. Uh, as we said earlier, doctrine is evolutionary. But this idea of combined arms employment, of joint and army capabilities, that is what makes this concept multi-domain. You, as soon as you talk joint, you're talking about domains other than uh, land-centric forces, uh, you know, employed by us or our allies and partners on the ground. Uh, this other idea is that we have to create and then exploit relative advantages with this situational awareness about what's possible in those different domains. And we're gonna talk about that when we talk about combined arms here in a little bit. Uh, and then to do what? To what purpose? All right, so we talk about achieving objectives. We achieve objectives short of armed conflict, right, when we contribute to conventional deterrence or what the National Defense Strategy now talks about in terms of integrated deterrence. Uh, but we also defeat enemy forces during conflict. And then we need to consolidate gains on behalf of those joint force commanders using the capabilities we bring to bear from the land uh, to achieve those long-term strategic objectives in some sort of way that's enduring. Uh, in terms of the national security, both for the United States of America and, and our allies and partners. And so below that, you see a couple of the di different ideas. So this idea of complementary and reinforcing, that's exactly what combined arms is. Uh, and this idea that we need to think about advantages and relative advantages in terms of the three dimensions of the operational environment, the human, the physical, and the information. We need to remember that in this type of operational environment, Land forces are gonna play a significant role in terms of enabling the other service components for a joint force commander. So land forces operating from land can enable the air and maritime components uh, of the joint force. And we have to get used to that idea instead of the last 20 or 25 years where the land component was always a supported component uh, by the other services primarily, right? And, and that comes into play when we talk about operations for example, in a maritime dominated environment. Uh, the concept is applicable to all echelons, right? From the theater army all the way down to squads. And, and the reason for that is we all work in, in a single operational environment that's characterized uh, by those aspects of that operational environment that are applicable to our assigned areas or our areas of operation. And so we need to be able to understand what the threat can bring to bear against us uh, in terms of the five domains and the three dimensions. Uh, and we need to understand what's the art of the possible in terms of what we can employ uh, to our own advantage against those threats. Um, they're applicable across that joint competition continuum. So we talk about context in which we conduct the operations on behalf of joint force commanders. And we talk about competition below the threshold of armed conflict. We talk about crisis and then we talk about conflict. And then lastly, uh, th this book, much like uh, in 2017, spends a lot of time talking about the importance of the defeat mechanisms and how we want to employ those defeat mechanisms in combination as simultaneously as possible to create unsolvable dilemmas. 
And you'll see that creating those types of multiple dilemmas for the threat is one of the imperatives of multi-domain operations. We have been saying that multi-domain operations, uh, that all Army operations are multi-domain operations since 2017. All right, so for most people that are familiar with our current doctrine, this is not a significant change. Uh, but what we have been able to do based on experimentation, uh, training, exercises, and, and so forth over the last five years uh, is to codify multi-domain operations into a doctrine that the current force between now and 2030 can execute against anybody anywhere in the world. 